Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And the missiles that the UK has sent to Ukraine have already struck targets down deep inside of the eastern side of Ukraine in Luhansk. Uh, those targets are, of course, uh, causing a lot of casualties, a lot of death over there right now. Um, and uh, this one here, this happened, I think, day before yesterday. And then another one again today uh, was struck inside of the Luhansk region there. And I'm beginning to learn more myself that the situation in Ukraine, um, heavily Great Britain is behind it. Boris Johnson specifically uh, behind it. I would reported a little while back that the United States was the one that had actually stop that peace agreement uh, between Israel, uh, excuse me, between uh, Ukraine, Zelensky's Ukraine, and that of President Putin of Russia when Putin had agreed to, and Zelensky had agreed to a peace agreement going back to the, uh, Russia was going to withdraw its troops, and all, everything was being laid out, and then Boris Johnson jumps in and totally put a stop to that. Now, I actually got some very interesting information from a good friend out of Ukraine uh, who is, I would have to say, more neutral in this battle, but yet obviously sees the truth of what's really going on now. Now, Russia, of course, though, uh, has already uh, did a retali basically what I would call a retaliatory strike there, hitting an ammunition depot there deep inside of uh, Ukraine. And, uh, and talk about, uh, we're talking about far west of Ukraine, says uh, that there were some 20 drones sent in, retaliatory strikes there, hitting the ammunition depot, also where the, uh, these uh, missiles for the tanks that are stored uh, for the Abrams and for the, uh, the, the German-made tanks there that are uh, definitely radioactive. So here's that explosion as it goes up there. It said it actually hit the Richter scale there like an earthquake. It was so massive uh, in its explosion there. You would almost think it was some kind of, you know, a little tactical type of nuke, but it wasn't. It was the fact that that plant there, or that, excuse me, that facility that they hit there was indeed storing massive amounts of weapons from the West there, and Russia just sent it up into smoke there. Now, Russia, too, taking some pretty heavy losses. They lost two colonels here uh, in the past 24 hours there, four uh, aircraft, two uh, uh, helicopters, as well as two of their fighter jets have been shot down as well in the country. So, this situation is definitely getting worse uh, by the moment here. And I took quite a bit of notes here from the meeting that I was uh, a part of there, uh, getting some information directly out of Ukraine that I wanted to be able to share with you here. And we also went back into the history of things just a little bit as well. And I'm going to share some of that with you. Now, as you guys already know, Zelensky did meet with Pope uh, Francis and... Uh, and basically, he's dismissing Pope Francis, any peacemaking deal he might even have to offer. That's pretty much a, a, of a great interest, as well as Boris Johnson's major control of what's going on inside of this war here. Basically speaking for NATO, you know, it kind of reminds me one time when I was uh, uh, meeting uh, with some people in the intel community, and we were discussing the issue about uh, the United States and the history of the United States, and that we are still a colony of the British Empire. And of course, uh, it was said that uh, if Russia, they know if they ever are going to take down the United States, all they have to do is take down Great Britain, and that will basically crush our nation as well, or at least that's the way Putin kind of thinks about that. But Zelensky basically told the Pope, no, thank you. We don't need your help in negotiating peace. Uh, he makes it looks like, looks like Ukraine will do their own negotiation type thing there. But let's face it, Zelensky is a puppet of the West. And when I say the West, that is Great Britain. That is NATO. He truly is a puppet. And if they don't want the war to end, believe me, that war is not going to end. Here is another... Uh, uh, view of that particular explosion that happened there uh, in Ukraine there uh, uh, in the last 24 hours there, far western part of Ukraine. Uh, almost looks like something out of the Middle East there, but it is Ukraine. And I did do some as much verification as I could 
uh, from other sources as well. And uh, yes, so that's what we got going up there. And there's another one that goes up there. And uh, of course, this is supposed to be an ammunition depot um, from what we can gather on that there. You know, the one thing that I found interesting as well, and this was part of the meetings uh, that we were looking at on this, is that Russia and Great Britain have always been at war uh, down for the last couple of hundred years there, but they're always proxy wars. They're never really direct confrontational wars, but proxy wars. And that's pretty much what we're having now. Great Britain has got hands off, but they are battling Russia once again, using the Ukrainian people to do exactly that. And uh, that's something that was just so sad. In fact, in part of the discussions that I was in recently, um, uh, in fact, I'll tell you what, before we get to that, let me just quickly just share with you here. Uh, this was the article that I, I'd mentioned to you where the former prime minister of Israel backed up that information I said when I told you through the intel that I had uh, that Russia was ready back in 2022 uh, to make that deal. I believe that was actually the March the 13th of 2022 is what I was told when that peace deal was supposed to be going down. And, uh, and of course, it was rejected. Um, you know, uh, Neftali Bennett had just about pulled that off uh, between Putin and Zelensky uh, having those meetings there. And he actually says the West put, put a stop to it there. Uh, I actually, let's see here. I think I got, was it on RT or was it here? Um, former Israeli prime minister who served... Uh, served briefly as a mediator at the start of the Russian war with Ukraine, says he drew a promise from the Russian president not to kill his Ukrainian counterpart. Neftali Bennett emerged as an unlikely uh, intermediator in the war's first weeks, becoming one of the new Western leaders to meet President Vladimir Putin during the war in a snap uh, trip to Moscow last March. Uh, while Bennett mediation efforts appear to have done little to end the bloodshed that continues until today. His remarks in an interview posted online late Saturday shed light on the back uh, backroom diplomacy uh, and urgent efforts that were underway to try to bring the conflict to a speedy conclusion in its early days. Uh, you know, as I said there, but it was Boris Johnson that does put a stop to that. I don't think that's in this one here. Let me see. I think it may have actually been in the Yeah, right here. Let's see. The Turkish broker talks collapsed last April when the Ukrainian delegation pulled out after a surprise visit to Kiev by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who urged Zelensky to keep fighting. Keep fighting. Isn't that interesting? You know, you know what's really fascinating, though, as I was told, though, that the, the whole problem with this war from the very beginning is there's never been any desire to even seek a peace. All the way going back to the Maidan coup uh, in, in 2014 up until now, there's never been a genuine effort to seek peace between Western and Eastern Ukrainians. In fact, I was told that, that the Western Ukrainians, they're a totally different mindset than Eastern Ukrainians. They consider themselves, uh, they were compared to being more like nationalists. And when it comes down to it, they figure that the East Ukrainians are just stupid. Flat out, plain as it gets, stupid. That's the way it was put, right? Here we have on Sputnik, Johnson prevents peaceful resolution of the situation in Ukraine, writes Bloomberg. Uh, said the author uh, uh, that uh, a trinity of high-ranking members of the British government is excuse me, blocking the path to a ceasefire. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss and Defense uh, Secretary Ben Wallace have used the Ukraine conflict to bolster their political capital, he said. In fact, they're even going so far as to say they'll do more than Boris Johnson to keep that war going. Basically, in a nutshell, what they'd like to, what they have been putting out there. Just some really crazy things that are going on. Anyway, Zelensky wanted to strike Russian territory, blow up the Druze Habab pipeline reports also coming out as well. Said Washington, U.S. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky had proposed behind closed doors to strike Russian territory and bomb the pipeline used by Russia to supply oil to Hungary, reported Sputnik, citing classified U.S. intelligence documents leaked through the Discord message platform. The Washington Post on Saturday said the documents reveal a leader with aggressive instincts that sharply contrasts his public-facing image as 
as the calm and stoic statesman. Uh, you know, all kinds of crazy things going on, guys. All kinds of crazy things going on. Listen, I got the map here up of Ukraine. Uh, let me just pull back a little bit. We'll just kind of look at some things here. Uh, to the far east right now, as we know, you see Donetsk right here. Just here to the east is Luhansk. Luhansk is that territory that's been hit a lot here lately. A lot of fighting going on on the front lines around uh, the Donetsk region there. Uh, but Kiev, one thing I wanted to share with you, especially those of you that may uh, support uh, Ukraine. I, I don't support any war myself. I support peace. I support uh, kindness and, and, you know, everything that Jesus stood for is what I support. In fact, the friend of mine, a, a, a believer, I, I, I learned a lot about the nationalist views that go on, especially in Western Ukraine. Uh, and if you're a Christian that does this for peace, you're really mocked and looked down upon inside of Ukraine if you're, if you're like that. Uh, but this is something I wanted to bring to you to your attention here. One thing that I was told about was the Buka uh, Oblast province of Ukraine. If you guys remember, Buka became a very major part of uh, in the early part of the war when Russia had came in and pretty much almost surrounded Kiev. Kiev was about to fall. And uh, a lot of people don't know that. They try to make it look like, oh, the Ukrainian military drove them all out. No, they didn't. Russia had quickly gained control and was about to cause Kiev to collapse. That's, by the way, when this meeting was going on uh, between Zelensky and that of Putin and, uh, of course, being brokered by Naftali Bennett. And Zelensky had said to Putin, you know, how can we negotiate peace when you're about to cause my city to collapse, the capital of Ukraine? He said, show good faith. Putin did show good faith. He pulled his troops back, and as a result, then the talks collapsed. Now, an interesting point on this, though, was the fake media that came out of there that the Russian troops had raped, pillaged, killed civilians, and raped children. Now, a lot of this information actually came out initially by uh, uh, this particular lady right here, uh, this, uh, Denisova, who actually was publishing those articles, the ones on the rape of children, only to find out later they were completely fabricated. No supporting evidence. And then on top of that, we had other issues going on as well. Russian troops, here's one of the things like Vox put out there, right? Russian troops pulled back from Kiev, leaving horrors in their wake right there. You know, they showed dead bodies strewn all over the streets and things of that nature there. And that just went all through the American media. And of course, along with the idea of we got to send more weapons to Ukraine to help the Ukrainians because the Russians, after all, are just slaughtering the people. Well, here I am speaking of a man that is not ethnic Russian, Ukrainian. He's just a Ukrainian. And he said the one thing that bothered him about the reports when they first came out is that it was totally opposite of what they knew was going on in the east of the country and in the south of the country. There weren't Russians killing all the civilians. Of course, we've had many reports we've shared with you here on Israeli News Live where uh, Ukrainian troops have killed civilians, and at least the reports that we're hearing about from the eyewitness testimonies that are coming out of, uh, out of that part of the region there, and blaming it on Russians. So we did some digging into the information that was shared with us. And I want to bring some of that up with you as well. All right. So in a case like this here, let's first, we're going to come back to uh, Miss Denisova, uh, pronounce her name right, uh, Denisova. We'll come back to her in just a little bit here. But here is one of those examples here. If you remember, they were showing you the news clips of this street here of all these dead bodies laying on the streets there after the Russians fled. 
Now, the article here tells you, it's a very interesting article here, said that when the Russians left, there were no dead bodies on the street. It took three days for them to put all this together. All right? They even show you in these, in these filmings, like in this one here, if you look at the mirror there, the body has moved, it's facing uh, parallel to the, to, the, to the curb there. And in this one right here, uh, the body has been turned. All right. Um, and again, let me take, let me back up a little bit here to get to the top of this here. This is the uh, situation in Buka. What really happened despite the fact that the information the Russian troops began to leave Buka and appeared on March 31st post about the large number of civilian victims left behind appeared only late in the evening on April the 2nd, two days later, and in the morning on April the 3rd. It is a time lag that causes great suspicion, since early in the Ukrainian side worked out all such facts very quickly and precisely. One gets the feeling that this time was used to prepare the largest provocation of the Maripol, uh, or after the Maripol uh, Maternity Hospital event. This will be discussed in our large uh, long read dedicated to this situation. Now, this whole article, and you can read it for yourself, goes into that uh, proving very, very thoroughly that Russia never did kill these civilians as it was claimed that they did, but just the opposite. And in fact, in one of the videos there, they show uh, the one of the bodies being drugged. I believe it's this one right here. Let's see. No, I got to get the video to do it with it. Um, they're dragging a body along there. And what the Russians were saying is that yes, this one right here said you don't drag a body and, and only be three to six meters away from it when you're dragging a body. If it's been uh, tampered with with a landmine. And by the way, another interesting fact that was brought in this article, if you'll notice on this guy here as he rolled over, it's a white armband. He's Russian, not Ukrainian, or sympathizer of Russia. All right, that was another thing they pointed out in here, is that even if you look at some of the victims that are on the street there and some of the photos, there it is right there, the white armband, see, uh, let me, let's point this out. I hate this thing. Keep popping up. Sorry about that. There are no bodies with the blue armbands in the video. Only those where they are, they are white, which is an, an identification mark for Russians. A resident with a white armband was perceived as a person neutral or allied with Russian troops. So yeah, they may be real bodies, but because the fact they were allied with Russian troops or were fighting with Russians, they were the ones that were killed. So very, very interesting how the information is distorted, right? Now, let's take a look. Let's back up just for a moment to the case of Denisova and the accusa accusations against her because her stories really blew up uh, and incited the people all over the world, Russian atrocities raping children. It says, and the reproaches addressed to her because of the two detailed descriptions of sexual crimes committed by Russian occupiers in Ukraine went even further and resulted in the accusation that she allegedly uh, composed those stories without having appropriate evidence. This is even the Ukrainian government coming against her. Uh, said from Facebook interrogations and uh, 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 Ombudsman Denosova invented the crimes of Russians and lost her position. Another part here. So this is a hypersensitive topic. And I know that many people cried because of these posts of Denosova from despair and anger. And it's because of this reaction which distracted from the essence of the text, we decided to change it. Uh, Misiava explained in a separate comment on UP. UP was one of the, uh, the uh, platforms that was publishing it. They had to change the information because it wasn't accurate. 
The main thesis that runs like a red thread in the article, Denosova allegedly came up with the terrible stories about the rape of children committed by the Russian military in temporary occupied territories of Ukraine. Went on to say here, the publication learned from its unnamed sources in law enforcement, the uh, ombudsman office and the leadership of the servant of the people that no one passed on the contacts of the victims, as well as the stories of the crimes that Denosova and her daughter voiced publicly to law enforcement officers. What, what was said to me about this lady is that later she even comes out, she was angry because somebody inside the government halls, whether it be Ukraine, NATO, or whoever was behind it, was getting her to do these types of stories, and she was doing them. And then she got upset because she was being thrown under the bus. She had become the fall guy. And yet, at the same time, that information was being fabricated in order to get Western sympathy uh, for the war in Ukraine there. Uh, but this is just articles about where they got it. Like here, according to the UP, the psychologist assured that in a month and a half, her hotline received about 1,040 calls, of which 450 concerned child rape. However, when the prosecutors took the official extract, it turned out that only 92 calls had been received on the phone for all that time. And if only 92 calls had been received... What was the percentage there? Almost hit to so it'd be like 40% would have been concerned about child rape. Was it even Russian soldiers then? In addition, like I said though, remember though, also she's admitted that the stories were fabricated. Not in these articles here. But from what the information I was uh, gleaning, that's what I was told about it. In addition, a UP source in the Servant of the People Party claims that Denosova did not coordinate her actions at all with the parliament under whose mandate she held the position, which ultimately became the basis of her swift dismissal. Hmm. Also, the author of the UP suggests that one of the Denosova's motives could be material enrichment and that her office could brazenly rob UNICEF which financed the work of the hotline lying about the effectiveness of the work it can not only uh, not only about ethical standards but also about breaking the law and therefore about criminal prosecution for fraud or theft suggests UP always there's propaganda coming out and wars in order to be able to get the sympathy of the people. It always happens. Um, anyway, I'll include these here in the link for you there. I apologize this weekend. We got really kind of got sidetracked. A lot of things going on. Wasn't able to be able to be here. Uh, uh, so many things happening. And we do need your prayers here as well. Um, a lot of criminality going on. Uh, and... A lot of people trying to get away with things that have been done to done to our family and stuff that is absolutely horrendous. So we do need your prayers 100% there. Let me continue on. A couple other things I wanted to share with you. And if I can just find the right. Um, uh, oh, by the way, this is also what he was talking about. If you look at the, he said the way that uh, the, the, that Russians did in the South and in the East. He said, totally different. In this case here, this article on express, uh, uh, express.co.uk, Russian soldiers killed and hundreds seriously Ill after eating Ukrainians fed them poisoned pie. Uh, but in the case of where Russians come in, Russian soldiers fed uh, Borshot and Ukrainian soldiers who surrendered in Z uh, Zaporo Z Zaya and they would take care of their enemies there. It says here, Rostov region, March 4th, 2022. Uh, the uh, Don 24 RU after Russian troops took control of the uh, Zephyr Zephyr nuclear power plant. Many Ukrainian soldiers were taken prisoner. This was reported by the Telegram Channel Major and General. 
At the same time, our soldiers, as it is customary in the traditions of the Russian army, showed a humane and humane attitude towards their former opponents. And you would hear about this types of treatment, totally opposite of what Ukrainians do. You know, I mentioned the, the individual I was speaking to uh, about the Azov Battalion being a neo-Nazi group, and they're the ones that seem to be behind most of the atrocities, and it's not so much Ukrainian soldiers in general. But I was told that there are more than just the Azov Battalion that have carried out atrocities uh, that are beyond belief in this war there. So that was something, too, that I figured I would share with you, too. Uh, the other thing that was really concerning to me was the uh, the former or, or the, the president back during the Maidan coup, Alexander, Alexander Turkunov, who had became the president of the country early on during the Maidan coup time period, uh, was actually a Baptist pastor, not just a Baptist pastor, but was head of one of the uh, independent church federations there in Ukraine. And he said never one time, he said you would think as a Christian, he would look to try to bring peace, especially knowing that these are Russian Orthodox Christians in the east of Ukraine. He said, but never one time, was there any indication for bringing peace whatsoever with the East and West Ukrainian ideologies? Even as the head of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, and here it is right here, the man put in charge holding the country together is a Baptist pastor. Alexander Turkunov, 49, he was recently uh, elected interim president by the Ukrainian government. Baptist pastor. His appointment came after the sudden departure of the former president, Viktor Yanukovych, who was under increasing pressure from Ukrainian citizens, citizens opposed to the country's growing ties with Russia. And I did ask about Yanukovych. I said, what was Yanukovych like? They said, well, actually, the country was, we were, they were better under Yanukovych on basic things. But they said the problem with Yanukovych, though, he was very greedy and he was trying to run all the businesses in the country. He wanted to control them. He said, this is what did not go over well with the Ukrainians in the West. And he said, as a result, that's what brought about uh, they, them trying to bring him down. He said, otherwise, he wasn't that bad of a guy. Uh, but, you know, there's none of them really seems to have that, that good of a, uh, that they're, they're just period, period, just not that good of people, no matter which way it goes. Anyway, these are some of the things that I wanted to share with you guys uh, while I was thinking about it here. And... Um, also, too, I'll be taking and doing a video in the morning. I already have some of this information up for you about these underwater volcanoes that are very serious issues that I'll probably be going over on our Patreon channel. And don't forget over on Patreon, too, uh, I loaded the video there about the... Um, about the firmament, uh, I guess in the firmament, the inner earth, things like that. Uh, overwhelming response from people that have watched that video. A lot of people really have been blessed by it, and I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, so I just wanted to remind you about that, that that's there. Uh, I'll be, again, I'll be going into the volcano issues there. And then also uh, keeping in mind, I'm going to be sharing with you this particular, and you guys that are seeing now can see it, uh, volcano.si.edu. Uh, this particular map here shows volcanic activity that you don't get on what you normally look at. See if you'll notice right here off the coast of Japan on uh, the earthquakes.volcanodiscovery.com. You don't see anything going off there, right? But same timestamp, the ones there that I have told you about now, uh, I told, well, I actually told you about the seismic activity that would go all the way from New Zealand all the way up to Japan. I told you about some events that are going to be happening. Uh, this is a little over a year, well, about a year ago, I told you about these things that would be coming that would be so devastating that uh, we have sent official notice to Japan. That's on our Patreon channel. Official notice to Japan that part of their island may go beneath the sea as a result. Well, their volcanoes are active there off the coast of Japan. Massive volcanoes. So we're going to talk about those things. Also, too, I told you about hypercanes, right? Hypercanes I told you about. I told you about that, gosh, what, year and a half, almost two years ago? And uh, we ended up having one season that they ended up suppressing a lot of the storms. Didn't end up making a record storm season as I was saying that it was going to be. But uh, here we have right here. Now, I don't say it's a hyper uh, uh, hurricane. 
in the of course out in the uh, the part of the uh, world where you have India, Japan, China, all those places there to get by, hit by these storms. I call them cyclones. Well, this one here, super cyclone storm. It was already when it uh, earlier. Uh, this has probably been about oh I don't know, ooh, 8 p.m. there local time on the 13th. It had reached up to 175 mile per hour winds. And I've told you we're going to see storms that are going to end up topping 200 mile per hour winds. It is coming. The closer we deal with this binary system that's happening, the worse it's going to get. So I'll try to put all that together for you guys tomorrow, share that with you, uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully it will certainly uh, help you guys out. And again, those are type things we normally share over on our, our um, platform on Patreon and uh, our YouTube channel. A lot of times I load that through the YouTube channel, Stephen Benoon, under my private name. So... Uh, and then every so often I'll make some of those videos public over there to where people can see those. Uh, in fact, uh, the one that I did on the firmament, I did that here on Israeli News Live, loaded it through Israeli News Live. So I may end up making that public. I haven't really made that full decision as of yet, but I might make that one public eventually. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And thank you for your support. Believe me, without you, we cannot do this. So I greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, we love you, and we really thank you for it. And like I said, keep our family in prayers there. Uh, this is really a very difficult time still that we're dealing with uh, as the events unfold about what happened to my father-in-law and our family as 